Hi, this is Peter Eby. I'm recording this lecture for the AUR regarding the clinical physics of breast imaging, and specifically this talk will be on MRI. I hope you enjoy it. Please, if you have any suggestions, questions, or comments, I would love to have your feedback. My email address will be at the end of this talk. So as you probably know, breast MRI is highly sensitive. In fact, we think it is the most sensitive test to detect breast cancer. However, it is not perfectly specific, meaning we find lots of things that are not breast cancer, and we have to make decisions about whether or not these require additional imaging workup or biopsy. I'm going to talk about that more and talk about how the physics of breast MRI impact our sensitivity and specificity. Keep in mind that the majority of our techniques, in fact, the way breast MRI was designed and developed, is based entirely on the differential enhancement of neoplastic and normal tissue after giving gadolinium. We will talk about image quality requirements, and then we'll talk about acquisition timing and how this might affect image quality. We will touch on case space. I know that excites everybody. We will then discuss the balance between spatial and temporal resolution and protocols that accentuate one or the other. Then we'll get into the use of 3T, and finally, diffusion-weighted imaging with MRI of the breast. As I stated before, MRI is probably the most sensitive test we have for breast cancer, but getting quality images really depend on the equipment that we have, the protocol we choose, and the pulse sequences that we design. A reliable and accurate interpretation of images is enhanced by consistency, both in the consistency in acquisition of the images and consistency in the way we read them. This will allow us to really optimize detection and then characterization of any finding, whether suspicious or not. Now, there are many acceptable methods to do this. Different people do it different ways. Um, we'll talk about some of the basic parameters that everybody uses as a foundation, and then allow individual choices about some equipment and spatial and temporal protocols to be exercised based on preference. So we really have to demand, balance the demands between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. An MRI is a fixed resource and we need to keep in mind the amount of time that patients are in the magnet and also the amount of time we dedicate to each individual exam, either to enhance throughput, to decrease wait times, or improve the bottom line. In the real world, these are the things that matter. We can minimize scan time and maximize throughput, um, which will also minimize patient motion. As with mammography, motion is the enemy of image quality. And it is helpful to keep in mind that we should acquire only the sequences that are absolutely necessary. Do not use or acquire anything superfluous. It's not in the patient's best interest to remain in a claustrophobic, loud tube, nor is it in our best interest to waste time acquiring images that do not add anything to interpretation. For example, we can acquire images in a sagittal plane and reformat in an axial plane. We don't need to acquire both. Now, the ACR has a breast MRI accreditation program, which has established some minimum standards for how the examinations are acquired and interpreted. It does allow lots of individual choice related to equipment, um, and it acknowledges that there are varial preferences uh, across different practices and the different systems have different capabilities. Now, this accreditation program is only mandatory for outpatient facilities if they want to bill and collect for the technical fee for MRI for Medicare patients. Private payers don't necessarily require this. Um, and it is voluntary for hospital-based facilities, which don't have to ascribe to these rules and can bill uh, and collect 
for the technical fee for Medicare cases. Now, if your facility wants to become a breast imaging center of excellence, uh, they are required to maintain accreditation for all modalities, MRI, ultrasound, mammography, and stereotactic biopsy. Even though some facilities may choose not to become accredited, it's useful to look at these minimum requirements. Uh, for example, there's no minimum field strength. While most of the research on breast MRI is done at 1.5 Tesla and a vast majority of examinations are required at that level, it can be done on 1.0s and it can be done on open magnets. Uh, however, the coil must be a dedicated bilateral breast coil capable of simultaneous parallel imaging. All other equipment parameters are really uh, based on preferences or the systems that are purchased and put into practice. Now, the one thing that is required because we are employing a test that is highly sensitive but not as highly specific, since we will discover lesions that are only visible on MRI and not visible on ultrasound or mammography, every single facility that provides breast MRI services must also either have the equipment and the capability to perform MRI-guided biopsy so that those suspicious lesions can be definitively diagnosed or refer the patients to another facility for those biopsies on a reliable and regular basis. And that facility should also uh, be accredited. Now, regarding the logistics of the examination, it should include the entire breast. This includes the axillary tail and the inframemory fold. It should not include tissue that is not relevant. And it is often helpful for radiologists to work with and educate the MRI technologists. In fact, it's highly recommended to have your mammography technologists, who may be familiar with positioning patients in stereotactic uh, biopsy devices on a prone table uh, to work directly with MRI technologists on how they position patients for diagnostic or screening breast MRI and MRI guided biopsies. They have a wealth of experience and would love to share it with them. These images show some examples of cases that have failed accreditation. For example, um, if the field of view is set at these gray lines, then the slices that are required at the top may miss the superior aspect of the breast tissue or exclude the inframammary fold. These would fail accreditation. Also, positioning is important. In this particular case, the bilateral medial breast tissue is folded on itself and some portions of the breast are obscured, including skin. For this image below, you can see that the left breast is hanging freely within the coil, positioned correctly. It's easy to distinguish the clock face location and configuration of the breast tissue. However, the right breast, unfortunately, has been caught in the coil while inserting and is now tethered and pulled up against the side with the nipple directed laterally. This is a fail, and this is also problematic for evaluating the actual exact location of any lesion that we might need to target with ultrasound for additional evaluation. Now the breast MRI protocol must include at least four sequences. A single fluid sensitive sequence, often a T2, but a STIR can also be used, uh, as well as three multi-phase T1 weighted series. One that is pre-contrast, one that is performed in the early phase after contrast administration and a third that is performed in the late phase after contrast administration. These are the minimum requirements for any breast MRI. In fact, a breast MRI could be performed with these four series and be finished. And this is what they would look like. These images are the courtesy of the University of Washington. The top image is a T2 weighted image. Then we have a T1 fat saturated pre-contrast an early post-contrast, and we can see enhancement in the uh, internal memory vessels as well as the heart, and uh, some suspicious non-mass enhancement, and then a delayed post-contrast, again, enhancement in 
the venous structures, uh, the nipples, which is normal, and segmental non-mass enhancement in the left breast. But we can add to this, and there are reasons for it. This sequence is a non-fat saturated T1 weighted image, which can be useful to improve our specificity. There are situations in which identification of fat within a lesion can allow us to avoid additional workup or biopsy. These would include identifying a small amount of fat in the hilum of a normal lymph node or identifying fat within some irregular fat necrosis that could look suspicious. We can also take our axial series and reformat them into sagittal, coronal, and subtractions. So this sagittal view shows the segmental non-mass enhancement in a uh, very obvious way, which may be extremely helpful for communicating the spatial distribution of disease to other members of the breast cancer team, such as the surgeons. Coronal views may also do this. Um, and then we have subtractions in the bottom. So this is a single slice subtraction in which the pre-contrast signal intensity at every voxel has been subtracted from the um, delayed post-contrast and all that is left are the uh, enhancing findings which include vascular structures, nipples, and the segmental non-mass enhancement that we know to be cancer. Uh, in the bottom middle we also see a MIP, or maximum intensity projection, that subtracts the pre-contrast from the post-contrast at every single slice and then creates a 3D view. Uh, it's actually uh, quite illustrative and summarizes the findings very rapidly for everybody involved. The accreditation program requires slice thicknesses to be 3 millimeters or less with no gap, and in plane frequency and phase pixel sizes must be 1 millimeter or smaller. Certainly, these slice thicknesses, and these, are, these are minimums. Uh, we can certainly uh, perform the examination to get thinner slices and smaller pixel sizes as well, if needed. Now the temporal resolution, that is the pre, early post, and late post contrast series, uh, have some stipulations. We must finish the acquisition of the early post contrast within four minutes of contrast administration. Uh, this is designed to maximize the early differences in signal intensity between normal and neoplastic tissue. The temporal resolution uh, is based on a model for invasive ductal carcinomas that demonstrate predominant uh, peak enhancement between 60 and 120 seconds following contrast administration. Uh, and that initial post-contrast examination should usually be centered around this interval. However, it can vary based on the length of the scan, the delay after contrast is administered, and how case space is acquired. And it's important to realize, of course, that there is significant overlap in the kinetics of benign and malignant lesions. Uh, there may be some benign lesions that enhance early and some malignant lesions that enhance late. If this is the model of signal intensity over time for a malignant lesion, and what we find um, is, again, that peak between 60 and 120 seconds. Uh, this image is a T1 fat suppressed pre-contrast image that does include a large cancer that is somewhat difficult to see because it has similar signal intensity characteristics to normal dense fibroglandular tissue. However, as soon as we administer contrast, you see the heart comes bright as well as this cancer that is invading the paralysis. Over time, that continues to enhance, uh, and then we will slowly see that it decreases enhancement in the background tissue. Uh, starts to enhance later in the phase. Now this is a diagrammatic representation of the simplest possible scan with a single pre and early post and a late post. And this will give us enough information to roughly plot a kinetic curve for every single voxel. Um, now with regards to case space, we have to keep this in mind when we time that early post-contrast series. So case space, as represented up here, are 
data that when converted will produce an image with high contrast and sharp edges. Now, the contrast information is generally acquired in the middle of K space. And so if we create an image based on just this small square from the center, we get pretty good contrast, pretty dark darks, fairly bright whites. However, our edge detail is terrible. These edges are all fuzzy. If we swap that out, what we get is an image with fairly sharp edges, but it is all gray. There's no contrast information here. We need both, of course, to produce a high quality image. <clears throat> this particular image is made from this segment of K-space, which gives us fairly decent contrast and fairly decent edge detail, but it's certainly not the quality of the full image created from the full data set. Why does this matter? Well, let's discuss. So most K-space is acquired in a linear fashion, beginning at the top and slowly adding data through the bottom line by line. If this is the case, then um, during the middle of the scan, we will acquire the contrast data. So for example, if this is a, a three minute scan, it is the middle minute that requires the contrast, contrast information. That informs our delay. So this particular scan then, we should center that middle minute at the peak. That will optimize the difference in contrast between normal and neoplastic tissue. Now, we might do it a different way. If the contrast or the case space is acquired from the center spiraling outwards, then the contrast information is acquired in the first minute. And in that case, we want to shift the start of the scan so that the first minute of the scan lines up with this peak and therefore there is a longer delay, okay? Now, either way is perfectly acceptable. All that matters is that we know how our system acquires K-space so that we can adjust the start time of that scan appropriately. Now, as I said before, this is the very most basic scan process, but there are more complex processes. For example, in this case, the sequence is designed to gather more information about the signal time intensity curve through more frequent sampling at shorter intervals. So multiple one minute scans up to eight, for example, provide many, many points along the curve. And this is fine for a team that wants to emphasize the temporal information. However, what's sacrificed in these slow scans is signal over noise and therefore slices are generally thicker and pixel sizes are generally larger. This is a sequence that is adjusted slightly more towards spatial and less towards temporal. Instead of eight post-contrast sequences, there are four and they are one and a half minutes long instead of one minute long. So you can see that we could get slightly higher resolution, but we sacrifice points on the curve. Pushing that further, then we can get very long sequences, up to four minutes. And remember, one of the requirements of the accreditation program is that the first scan is finished within four minutes of contrast information. So this would be the absolute longest early scan. Uh, this is going to provide very, very high spatial resolution, very thin slices, very small pixels. Um, however, there will only be three points on the curve required. And that's fine if you and your team want to read the examinations that way. Now, we can also look at the effects of changing some of these parameters. This is a protocol performed on a 1.5 Tesla magnet. And there are one pre-contrast and three post-contrast series that are each uh, almost three minutes long. And the slice thickness is 1.6 millimeters and the in-plane resolution 0 0.83 by 0 0.83 millimeters. Now if we change 
some of these parameters. Oh, and here's what it looks like. So first scan at three minutes, second three to six, and third six to nine. And these scans are all the same uh, length with the same resolution so that uh, the pre-contrast can be subtracted from any one of them for viewing. Now this is a, a different protocol. This is one that we use at Virginia Mason where we vary the timing of the post-contrast scan. So there's a pre-contrast scan that's 60 seconds and then we perform a uh, another 60 second scan uh, 20 seconds after giving contrast and then uh, another one at 120 seconds and then that's followed by a four minute scan uh, starting at the conclusion of the second one minute scan and then there's another one minute scan at the end I will show you how this looks graphically so one minute one minute one minute four minutes one minute the goal of this protocol is to allow simultaneous multi-point temporal resolution one two three um, and two in the early phase along with a very long scan that is high resolution this is just as acceptable as this type of scan or any other that your group might decide to pursue as long as it meets the minimum requirements of the accreditation uh, with the ACR and I highly recommend that it remain consistent. Again, performance is usually enhanced when the scan is the same time and again and the radiologist can assess for small changes for year to year in a high risk screening population for example or becomes accustomed to what suspicious things look like uh, from one patient to the next. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about three Tesla imaging and diffusion weighted imaging and abbreviated protocols as um, additional developments and how the physics impacts imaging. So as I stated earlier, most clinical breast MRI has been performed at 1.5 Tesla, but three Tesla magnets are now widely available and used. And there are some advantages potentially to increase signal to noise ratio. So for example, Increasing signal to noise can improve fat suppression and we can get higher spatial or temporal resolution. Consider, for example, that at 3T at the same amount of time as uh, we were using at 1.5T, we get more signal uh, so we can get thinner slices in that same amount of time. The other option, of course, is to decrease the amount of time of each sequence keep the spatial resolution the same, but then we can do more of those sequences and get more points along the kinetic curve, so thereby improving temporal resolution. Uh, a higher signal or a higher strength magnet is also a platform for more functional imaging, including diffusion-weighted MR spectroscopy or uh, mold imaging, and we'll talk about DWI. So, I had shown you this protocol uh, from the University of Washington, I'm sorry, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, that was 1.5 Tesla, uh, and the sequences were nearly three minutes long, and the result was thickness of 1.6 millimeters with in-plane resolution of 0 0.83. Now, I'm just going to show you how this was adjusted or changed by going to three Tesla. So. The timing was the same, the exam did not get any longer or shorter, but the resolution improved. So 0 0.83 by 0 0.83 was converted to 0 0.71 by 0 0.71, and slice sickness went from 1.6 millimeters down to 1.4 millimeters. So that, for example, is the difference. Um, and the timing, the overall timing, 21 minutes, was the same. Um, so that is the potential advantage of increasing field strength. Uh, what we also tend to see is that there's some uh, greater spectral separation of fat and water, although there is increased chemical shift with three Tesla magnets. <clears throat> we can also see some improved resolution. For example, this mass on 1.5 Tesla looked oval and was considered probably benign. However, viewing it on a 3T showed some 
speculation in the margins, which changed the Bayard's assessment to a four, and it turned out to be a small invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, this is also a side-by-side -side comparison of a benign fiber adenoma at 1.5 and 3T. Uh, at 3T, what we can see is a slightly improved resolution that allows us to visualize the dark internal septation or non-enhancing septation that is a classic feature of a fiber adenoma and might allow us to simply call this benign rather than recommend a targeted ultrasound. There may also be some improvement in visualization of multifocal or multicentric disease. So this is the same patient imaged on 1.5 and 3 Tesla. Uh, she had a diagnosis of known cancer. There was, this is the known cancer. On the 1.5T, this mass in the lateral breast was seen and confirmed malignant. However, at 3T, there were multiple additional satellites that were identified uh, that were also uh, sites of malignancy overall leading to a more accurate delineation of the extent of disease. And we just have to keep in mind that it's not as simple as plugging in your three Tesla magnet and playing along. There are some things that have to be adjusted. So there is increased inhomogeneity in the B0 and the B1 fields at 3T um, and T1 relaxation um, is significantly changed by increasing field strength um, up to 21 to 17 percent depending on whether we're looking at fat or fibroglandular tissue. Um, this is important because we use computer-aided detection systems to show color and to show us the temporal kinetics and we set thresholds that represent a percentage of change from the pre-contrast baseline to the post-contrast imaging. If T1 relaxation um, is changed, then the percentage that those signal intensities change uh, from pre to post-contrast is also affected. And what has been noticed and published is that uh, thresholds need to be lowered uh, at three Tesla so that enhancing lesions can still be seen on CAD color maps. Now diffusion weighted imaging provides us with some unique tissue information and uh, breast cancers like other neoplasms have been shown to have restricted diffusion with lower ADC values compared to normal and benign tissue. Now this can be another sequence that's added to improve specificity. So as I mentioned earlier, for example, a non-fat saturated T1-weighted image can help us identify lymph nodes or fat necrosis and thereby avoid patient recalls and unnecessary biopsies. Um, DWI has the potential to do this as well. Uh, it can also be used to measure the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the very early or short term. Um, or there's hope that DWI could be used as a non-contrast breast MRI screening tool, but that has not been realized quite yet. Um, this is an example of diffusion-weighted imaging and apparent diffusion coefficient mapping that, can, that shows some differences between neoplasms and benign tissue. This is an irregular enhancing mass that has high signal on DWI, but has um, a low ADC. By comparison, this is an oval, smoothly enhancing mass known to be a fiber adenoma that's also bright on DWI, but has a higher ADC, so less restriction on that diffusion. And the hypothesis is that this information could be used to further decrease recalls and biopsies. In fact, it's been investigated. The Akron 6702 was a 10 site multi center trial that enrolled 107 women with 81 lesions and concluded that diffusion weighted imaging can reclassify a substantial fraction of breast MRI findings as benign and thereby decrease unnecessary biopsies. In fact, by proposing an ADC threshold of 1.53, uh, this lowered the biopsy rate by 20% without affecting sensitivity. So no cancers were missed, but biopsies were reduced by 
So this is a significant improvement in patient care. Now these um, ADC values still need to val be validated, but this is where we are headed. This is published in 2019. Now abbreviated breast MRI is um, another technique that simply makes the examination shorter. So rather than perform three or four or five close contrast sequences, uh, the exam can be shortened by only performing one early post-contrast sequence. The idea here is that perhaps the kinetic information may not be as important as we once thought, and that the early enhancement that happens while, back, while normal tissue is, is not enhancing uh, and differences are maximized is enough to potentially screen patients or even provide accurate diagnostic information. So this is an example of an abbreviated protocol that has been done in Germany. Um, there's essentially one pre-contrast sequence that is not fat saturated. This allows it to be very fast. And then another uh, post-contrast sequence that's not fat saturated. And then they are subtracted. Okay. So uh, this pre-contrast is subtracted from this post-contrast, giving us this slice or this MIP. Uh, this is one thing that I did not mention before, is that most breast MRI that you will see is performed uh, with T1 fat saturation. However, it is perfectly acceptable to perform it without fat saturation and then look at the subtraction images to allow these brightly enhancing masses to show up. Uh, in this particular trial, the acquisition time is only three minutes. We're doing one pre and one post. Um, and with just two sequences uh, that can be then converted to subtractions, the interpretation can be done in 30 seconds with an extremely high sensitivity and specificity. Now, the proposal is that women could get screened in three minutes, and then if needed, they could be brought back for a complete diagnostic protocol that would include multiple additional sequences as described. But this hasn't been put into wide use just yet. Um, certainly at three minutes we could process many, many women, uh, for example, who are at high risk, uh, as opposed to the 20 to 30 minute protocols that are in place now. So to summarize, um, MRI and the clinical physics. The accreditation program provides some requirements and guidelines for high quality imaging that are minimums, uh, but there are many ways to skin the breast MRI cat. Uh, we can certainly match sequence timing with contrast peak from malignancy. That's important uh, and that informs how our case space is, uh, adjusts our delay after initial contrast. And of course there are trade-offs between spatial and temporal resolution and each facility is allowed to uh, adjust those according to some preferences as long as they can meet certain minimum requirements. <clears throat> this allows us basically to perform a very highly sensitive and highly specific examination, which can be done at either 1.5 or 3.0 Tesla, which can produce great images, but they have some advantages and disadvantages. What we're seeing now is that diffusion-weighted imaging uh, has some very strong potential to improve our specificity, which is great for patients, and that abbreviated MRI techniques could allow us to screen more women at a shorter amount of time, uh, which again would be beneficial for those high-risk patients. And these are active areas of research that should yield pretty effective results in the near future. That's all Regarding breast MRI clinical physics, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Uh, Peter Eby at virginiamason.org. Thank you very much.